I'm going to be preaching you to you today from John chapter 10, uh, where Jesus speaks about being the good shepherd, uh, a passage that is familiar, I'm sure, to, to many of us. But before we get to that, uh, who's a gardener? Is anybody a gardener out there? Does anybody, does anybody actually enjoy gardening, like getting into the garden? I mean, okay, we've got one up the back, only one other. Oh, yeah, there's Stevanus, thank you. Excellent. I, I have been forced into being a gardener, I must say. Uh, I, we bought a house and there were gardens in the house. They had to be kept up and so I'm a reluctant gardener. Uh, a few years ago, um, we have a, quite a large front garden with lots of plants in it. And um, my wife said, I don't really like the front garden. And I, I didn't really like it either. It was, it was, it was a weird kind of style from the previous um, residents of the house. And so we uprooted the whole garden. We put in new soil. Uh, we put all new plants in this garden, including a magnolia tree. You know, magnolia tree, that they have beautiful white flowers, this particular magnolia. And I had visions in my head of this huge big magnolia tree growing uh, in the middle of this garden and producing wonderful, uh, you know, scores of wonderful white flowers uh, every year. It hasn't worked out that way. <laughs> it does produce flowers but most of its branches look unhealthy and it's never really grown taller than me. It's only about as tall as me after about six or seven years. And um, <laughs> we're thinking about uprooting it at the moment and planting something else. But I think the problem is the soil, what it's planted in. There's a, there's a lot of clay in the soil and I think this magnolia tree is not getting enough food, enough nutrients or enough water and so it never really grows. As Christians, we can grow or not grow. Christians can be people who stay the same and are never all that healthy as Christians or they can grow and become fruitful. And we know that Jesus wants us to be fruitful and in Christian circles, we call this growing as a disciple. Uh, it begins, growing as a disciple begins with what we are planted in. And the soil that we are planted in is Jesus himself. Uh, Paul wrote to the Colossians of Christians, disciples being rooted and built up in Christ Jesus. It is only as we sink our roots, our thoughts, our hearts deep down into Jesus that we actually grow. Now at BMAC we're doing uh, a short discipleship series. Uh, the reason for that being I'm going to Bangladesh uh, in November to preach to um, the SIM team with John and Fiona McIver in Bangladesh. They wanted me to preach on discipleship. And I thought it would be helpful for BMAC to hear those uh, same sermons. So we're preaching four weeks, but it begins with Jesus himself. We have to learn how to trust in Jesus before we can grow as disciples. And so today I wanted to bring that first sermon to you from John chapter 10, where Jesus speaks of himself as being the one we follow. In verses 1 to 5, Jesus describes sheep who follow the shepherd alone. And then he calls himself a gate in verses 7 to 10, and then the shepherd in verses 11 to 18. And what we're going to do is we're going to step through these sections of uh, John 1, 1 to 18, and learn what it means to be a disciple with roots who go down deep into the Lord Jesus. And then we're going to take a close-up look at verse 10, where Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and life to the full, abundant life. And today we'll learn that Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, is someone who follows Jesus into 
abundant life. A disciple follows Jesus into abundant life. Let me pray before uh, I, I speak any further. Father, we praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are the sheep of his pasture. So, Lord, Holy Spirit, we ask that you teach us how to live as disciples. May the words of my mouth now and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now in John chapter 9, Jesus has been arguing. He's been arguing with some Pharisees whom he has accused of being blind. You might remember that story in John chapter 9 where the blind man who was blind from birth had been healed by Jesus. And then he argues with the Pharisees and they kick him out of the synagogue and then Jesus goes to bat against the Pharisees. And so... We know that when we get to the beginning of chapter 10, Jesus has claimed in various ways to be the Messiah, to be the one that the Jews were waiting for. And yet these Pharisees were blind to him. It's like they'd put their hands over their eyes and refused to see Jesus. And it is, you know, we usually look, read John chapter 10 and think about Jesus being the good shepherd as being a message for us believers. But actually Jesus spoke them to people who were not believers. These were Pharisees who refused to believe. So let's read verses 1 to 5. I'll read that out to you. Is it possible to get that up, verses 1 to 5, in maybe English or Bahasa? Or in Bahasa? Yeah, Bahasa is good. But can I get someone else... To to come up and read it. I think I, I, I picked on, who did I pick on last time? I picked on May before, but does anybody else want to come up and read these verses out to the rest of the congregation? Stephanus, thank you. Tetapi siapa yang masuk melalui pintu, ia adalah gembala domba. Untuk dia, penjaga membuka pintu dan domba-domba mendengarkan suaranya dan ia memanggil domba-dombanya masing-masing menurut namanya dan menuntunnya keluar. Jika semua dombanya telah dibawanya keluar, ia berjalan di depan mereka dan domba-domba itu mengikuti dia karena mereka mengenal suaranya. Tetapi, Seorang asing pasti tidak mereka ikuti, malah mereka lari daripadanya, karena suara orang-orang asing tidak mereka kenal. Amen. Thanks, Stefanus. Yeah. I, I don't know, what, what does it say in the Indonesian? In the English, it talks about a sheep pen. What, what does it say in verse... Uh, In verse 1, what does it say for sheep pen? What's, what's that word in Indonesian? Where the, where the sheep are kept? Kandang. Kandang? Kandang domba. Ah, domba. Domba is a sheep. The kandang, right, okay. Kandang, does that mean an enclosure? Is that, is that what it means? Okay, right. In English, we have this word sheep pen, which is a weird word. It doesn't mean... A pen you use to draw on sheep with, which is what it sounds. It sounds like the Indonesian is a little bit more direct. Um, uh, it, it is just the walls around the sheep. Um, it's their home overnight. In, uh, uh, in many parts of the world, uh, even today, shepherds will graze their flocks out on, in the fields and then bring them back at night into the sheep pen. Uh, and usually there'll be more than one flock 
in the sheep pen. So when I was in Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia, I went up to the place where they had the pastures over the summer, beautiful up in the mountains, you know, sort of three, 4,000 metres up in the mountains and they'd be grazing their sheep on the green hillsides. But then they would bring all the sheep back in and they'd all be together, all the different flocks together. So the image here is of lots of different flocks being together in the sheep pen, but the sheep know their own shepherd, the one to whom they belong. And, and that's what Jesus is trying to get across to the Pharisees. Christians, or the real people of God, they know their shepherd. They know the one to whom they belong. Really, this is John's version of what Christians call predestination. That is, there are those who know, uh, those who are known by God, who belong to Him. Uh, he comes back to this idea of predestination later on in the chapter, and he also talks about it in chapter 6 and 17. Jesus talked about, to God, about those you gave me. In his ministry on earth, there were those that God had given him, particular people uh, out of everybody, his own sheep. He says in chapter 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. So some people are chosen by God to be Jesus' sheep and they know his voice. We know his voice, don't we? I wonder if you can remember the first time when Jesus' voice suddenly was recognisable to you and you thought, oh, I know this, I know this one. I know this one who is speaking. He is my shepherd. You may not have thought that consciously, but do you remember that first time of recognition? You know, I was brought up in... A, a nominal Christian family, so we went to church Christmas and Easter. I, I was I was baptised as a child and confirmed way too young before I really understood uh, what Jesus is all about. So when I was a teenager, I didn't know Jesus. I didn't follow Jesus. I considered myself an atheist. But then some friends convinced me to read the Bible. And as I read the Gospel of Matthew, as I read it through, it, it just... It made sense. There was this one who was speaking and I recognised him. Now, why did I recognise him? I didn't, I wasn't following him. I, I didn't call myself a Christian. I was a stranger to him. And yet, as I read the Bible, I heard his voice. I recognised him. And that's what happens to all who are chosen by God. We, we may not be listening for a long time. But then suddenly when the Holy Spirit chooses, Jesus' voice is clear in our minds as our shepherd, as the one we listen to. We know his voice. Now in what follows in verses 7 to 18, Jesus is not just explaining verses 1 to 5. He's already made the point that his people listen to his voice alone. Instead, Jesus reinterprets this shepherd and sheep image in two different ways. Verses 7 to 10 portray Jesus as the gate and verses 11 to 18 as he calls himself the good shepherd. Jesus as the gate is stated in verse 7. It would be helpful if we can get that up uh, in verse 7. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Maka kata Yesus sekali lagi, Aku berkata kepadamu, sesungguhnya akulah pintu ke domba-domba itu. Pintu is gate, is that right? Uh, door, yeah. The door. Gate okay. or door. Yeah. Door, yeah, yeah, okay, great. What does this mean? What does it mean that Jesus is, is the pintu, the door, the gate? Well, he tells us in verse 9, he's going to explain it in verse 9, but in verse 8, he returns to a theme from verses 1 to 5, and that is the thieves and robbers. Uh, he says in verse 1, 
All who have come before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep have not listened to them. Actually, is that verse 8? Oh, that's verse 8, isn't it? These thieves and robbers. Oh, yeah, read it out. Yeah, okay. Well, no, yeah. <laughs> Semua orang yang datang sebelum aku adalah pencuri dan perampok. Dan domba-domba itu tidak mendengarkan mereka. Thank you. These thieves and robbers, as verse 1 says, do not enter by the sheep pen by the gate, but climb in some other way. The Pharisees, whom Jesus was speaking to, didn't enter or didn't try to enter the kingdom of God through Jesus. That is, by faith in Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. They were trying lots of different other ways to get into the sheep pen. They thought that by obeying the law and by reinterpreting the law, they would be the people of God. But you might remember several times in the Gospels, Jesus says, you are not mine. You do not belong to God. Uh, you are coming in the wrong way. And God can raise up other people uh, who will follow me. He doesn't need you Pharisees because uh, they were trying to make their own way into uh, the kingdom of God. But there's only one way. Uh, Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. See, Jesus is the only way that we get into the kingdom of God. When you came into church this morning, you came in by one door, didn't you? That door up there. Now, if you tried to come in, let's say you tried to come in through the window. Imagine if you tried to break through the stained glass window to get into church. How would the other people in the church feel about you? Not very happy, right? Say, what are you doing? Come in through the door. There's one way to get in. There is one way into the kingdom of God, and that is through Jesus alone. Perhaps you've memorized John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And they're the same words he uses, through me. It is the only way. He's the only gate into the kingdom of God. So the disciple of Jesus is a person that, who knows that they have eternal life and belong in the kingdom of God only because of Jesus. We are saved by grace alone. We come in through that door alone, uh, who is Jesus himself. In verses 11 to 18, Jesus says, he is the good shepherd. We won't read through uh, the whole passage, um, but I'm sure you're familiar with these words. I am the good shepherd. He says throughout verses 11 to 18 that he is the one who lays down his life for the sheep. He took up the cross. He went to the cross for us. He said, in chapter 15, greater love has no one than this to lay down their life for their friends. Friends, this is what makes Jesus the good shepherd. He lays down his life for us. He cares for us so much that he sacrificed his life for us. Jesus says in this, this passage, the hired hand cares nothing for the sheep in verse 13. Because the sheep don't belong to the hired hand. But because we belong to Jesus, he cares for us so much that he laid down his life for us. He gave up everything because he loves us. And this is what marks us as a disciple. We hear Jesus' voice, number one. We recognise Jesus' voice. Number two, we take the only way into the kingdom of God there is, that is the gate who is Jesus Christ. And thirdly, we experience um, that kingdom of God uh, through what Jesus has done in laying down his life for us. We know 
that he loves us that much. And we live in that love, the length and depth and height and width of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And that knowledge of Jesus as the good shepherd who lays down his life for us is so incredibly comforting, isn't it? When our circumstances disturb us, we can look to Jesus and know who we are, that we are at home with God and nothing changes that. Things might be going on in our lives that are just awful and there are plenty of awful things that happen in this world. There is illness, there is death, uh, there is relationship breakdown, there are stresses and strains in everybody's lives from all sorts of different avenues. At BMAC this morning, uh, we prayed for a man, a, a, a Ukrainian family, um, and the husband has just lost his brother in the war. He was fighting on the front line and he died in the war and uh, just on, on Friday. And so we prayed for him as a church. That's awful, isn't it? Awful being in another country, in Australia, and your own brother being conscripted into the army forcibly and then being killed on the front line. Now his world, Bogdan, our Ukrainian brother in Australia, his world has been ripped apart and yet he knows his good shepherd. He knows who Jesus is and so Jesus is his rock at this time. Jesus says later on in the chapter, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What a comfort this is to know that we have a permanent place with Jesus and nothing can change that. Christians, before they have ever done any good for Christ, belong with Christ. Jesus lets you in through that gate. He makes you part of his people before you've done anything good at all, he just chooses you and makes you one of his sheep. What I want to think about now in more detail is that second half of verse 10. If we can get verse 10 up and um, Stephanus, if you would please read verse 10. Pencuri datang hanya untuk mencuri dan membunuh dan membinasakan. Aku datang supaya mereka mempunyai hidup dan mempunyainya dalam segala kelimpahan. Thank you. It's an extraordinary statement, isn't it? I mean, most of Jesus' statements were pretty extraordinary, but but this is really a verse to pin your whole life on. I have come that they might have life and life to the full. Jesus, the Son of God, who laid down his life for us, did that so that we might have abundant life, a life to the full. And that life now means provision and guidance and protection. Now, it may be that Jesus had Psalm 23 in mind as he spoke uh, these words. Certainly, Uh, The way that David wrote about abundant life um, uh, matches Jesus' words here. Uh, Jesus said in verse 9, They will come in and go out and find pasture. David wrote in verses uh, 1 to 3, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. That is a picture of abundant living for the sheep. Plentiful food and drink and a smooth path to walk on. And friends, this this is our lives. This is abundant living as a disciple of Jesus Christ. He provides and he guides. He gives us everything we need and he tells us where to go and how to get there. 
We know he wants the very best for us, don't we? Because he's given up his life for us. He loves us so much that he gave up his very life for us. And so we know that he will provide us with all that we need. In fact, um, Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God will give us everything we need. So we depend upon him. Instead of worrying, we trust. Instead of trying to figure out everything for ourselves and make our own path, we follow him. We listen to him. But let me say loud and clear, brothers and sisters, but this trust in Jesus must be complete. We have to hand our whole lives over to him. The disciple of Jesus does not decide by themselves what is best any more than a sheep decides what is best for them. Sheep are foolish. They're stupid. They, you know, that's why Jesus used this parable. They can't look after themselves. They're a highly domesticated animal. They need the shepherd to make the decisions. And that's, we've got to put that into practice in our own lives and let Jesus decide what is best for us. What is best for us may not be a mansion on the bay. It may not be marriage or children. It may not be complete mental health. Those things are not given. Jesus hasn't promised those things. We cannot decide what is best for us and then turn to Jesus to provide and to guide I've seen a number of Christians disappointed in God and in Jesus because they decided what was best and then said, Jesus, give this to me. He didn't do it. They got disappointed. We must only depend upon what Jesus has promised to us and we let him decide what is best. Don't make up your own life plan for yourself and then ask God to give that to you. You trust in him with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and he will decide. He knows what is best and he will determine our path. It is just up to us to trust. I myself never for a moment planned to be, first of all, I didn't plan to be a pastor. Even when I was a mature Christian, wanting to serve Jesus full time, I did not want to be a pastor. I actually said to people, why would you stay in Sydney and be a pastor? There are people who need to learn about Jesus all over the world. Why stay here? That's what I said in Bible college. I said that to other Bible college students and here I am. Jesus chose a different path for me. I also didn't want to be 15 years in the one church. You know, I, I, even as a student minister, even as an assistant minister, I remember thinking, I don't think I said it, but I remember thinking, oh, you can't. You can't stay that long in a church. That's overdoing it. You've got to move on. Here I am. God keeps on calling me here, and so here I stay. My plan for my life, if you want to know, back in Bible college, was to be in Central Asia uh, teaching Muslim background pastors the Word of God, to be a, a Bible college lecturer in Kyrgyzstan. And yet, that wasn't the path God had chosen for me, and he, he made me do something different. You know, I can look back upon 32 years of following the Good Shepherd and know that he has provided all that I have ever needed and he has guided me onto a path that is very good. I'm quite happy being a pastor now, so <laughs> don't misunderstand me. It just wasn't the path that I had originally chosen. And he will do the same for you. <laughs> don't figure out your own path in advance. It's good, to, it's good to head in a certain direction, to make plans, but hold those plans with a very open hand because... 
God could completely change it and put you somewhere completely different. Jesus also promised to protect his sheep. Now we've, uh, we've already touched on this. I, I quoted from the verse that said that Jesus, uh, where Jesus said that no one would snatch us out of his hands. Now life is very fragile and uh, it can disappear in the blink of an eye. You know, really as we look around us, there's nothing that's firm, nothing that's solid. And the Bible teaches us over and over again that our lives can disappear like that. The Bible says all people are like grass. They're here today and gone tomorrow. We can just disappear. You know, two weeks ago, two men were out fishing on, on the bay in Brighton Sands in a boat. Quite a normal thing to do. But then a whale came up underneath the boat or next to the boat and flipped the boat. One of the men drowned. So it was a normal day for him. Six o'clock in the morning, beautiful sunrise, I imagine. And yet then his life is gone. That is how fragile life is. There are many physical and spiritual threats to our lives and we have no idea what is under the surface. We have no idea what is coming next. Now Jesus said, in verses 12 and 13, that the hired hand sees the threats and runs away, abandoning the sheep. But our Lord is no hired hand. He stays. He doesn't run away when threats come into our lives. He lays down his life for the sheep, verse 11. But again, we must remember that Jesus knows what is best for us. Protection from the Lord Jesus does not mean the absence of harm. It does not mean that he is going to protect us from everything bad that's going to happen in our lives. It does not mean that when we get sick, he is definitely going to heal us. Disciples do get sick and die. They get hungry. They are persecuted for their faith all over the world. Disciples lose their jobs. Disciples lose their marriages. Disciples even lose their children. Protection does not mean that the wolves that Jesus refers to in, in verse 12 are taken away. David wrote in Psalm 23, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. When we face threats and dangers, Jesus promises not to take those things away, but to be present, to not be absent. Now that begs the question, doesn't it? Why does Jesus let these things in my life? How can Jesus let me get sick and maybe die? How can I lose my job? How could my wife leave me? It, it, it's worth asking those, those questions. The answer is that Jesus uses every bad thing that comes into our life into an opportunity to know God's love in a deeper way and to become more like Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, it also says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness and uses everything for our good. Trust in the Good Shepherd means that no matter what threats we face, we know that He is with us, turning that threat, that danger, into a good thing. I know people who have lost absolutely everything, who have lost their families, who have lost their possessions, who have lost their friends, uh, who have lost their self-control. And yet now, they are happier than they have ever been. They know Jesus more fully than they ever did before. And they are more like Jesus. Some of the most joyful people I know are those who have been through great suffering in their lives. Friends, a disciple of Jesus 
follows him into abundant life. And that is a life of provision and guidance and protection. We can be sure of this because we know whose voice uh, calls us. We know that he has led us into the kingdom of God by dying in our place. He is the good shepherd and in him alone we trust. Amen. 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 How about I pray? Father, we do thank you for your son, Jesus. He is our good shepherd. Lord, we thank you that he came to die for us. Thank you that he laid down his life for us, that he went through extraordinary suffering and pain and turmoil just so that we could be free of sin and death and Satan. We thank you, Father, that he rose from the dead. We thank you that when he stepped out of tomb, the hold that death and Satan have over us was broken. We thank you, Lord, that he has granted us life to the full. We thank you for that, he, that he came for that reason. Lord, we submit our understanding to you. We submit our desires to you. We submit our lives to you. Lord, we take up our own cross and we deny ourselves and we follow Jesus. Father, please help us to trust in him, especially when things happen in our lives that we don't expect. Father, we pray that um, our trust in the Lord Jesus would be unwavering. Uh, Lord, we know that your servant Abraham did not uh, waver through unbelief, uh, but entrusted everything to you. Help us to be like Abraham. Uh, Lord, uh, please decide for us what is best in our lives. Uh, Lord, we know that you are making us people not just for this life, but for eternity. We know that you are forming us into the right people for eternity. Help us to have that perspective, Lord. Help us not to be short-sighted and wonder why you are doing things now, but help us to see the big picture and see what you are doing in, in our lives, in, in our personalities, in our makeup, so that we might be fit for the new creation, the kingdom of God, where Jesus, our shepherd, shall lead us when he returns. In his name we pray. Amen.